Well, happy Thursday, everyone, or happy day, whatever day you're listening to the podcast. It's just Thursday when we're going to put this particular episode out. Welcome, everyone, to Pucks and Brews. This is episode number 31, if I remember correctly. I'll, uh, you know, say that for certain in a second, but I'm joined, as always, by my esteemed co-host at this point, basically, uh, Liam, the Chillmaster Gautamer. Liam, what's up? Nothing much, Shades. I love to answer that question with the sky, because that's what's up. Mm. Uh, but uh, everyone at my workplace and everybody um, in my life is probably sick of that at that point. But uh, I'm doing well, Shades, you know, another good week of hockey. You know, the Rangers went one for two. But uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll get all into that upcoming. Yeah, and a good weekend for football, too. A very good weekend for football, for sure, for New York fans. I mean, I can't relate. I'm a Jets fan, but just you, looking you at all the both. happy Giants fans, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm happy for them. I'm happy that they're happy. Look, personally, I hate the Giants, but Brendan's a uh, a Giants fan, and like I root for the happiness of my friend, but at the same time, it still kills me when the Giants win. Right. You know, for me, just growing up as a Jets fan, we never experienced winning all that much that the rivalry, you know, for the, you know, same state team uh, didn't really exist for me. So I didn't really have that hatred for the Giants like I do the Islanders or the Yankees. So, I mean, only... The last few years have I really gotten immersed in the Jets. So, I mean, maybe give it four or five years of some successful Jets football, then maybe I'll start hating on the Giants a little bit more. Yeah, honestly, I think the thing is that, I mean, they play in the same stadium, but they're in different conferences, which to this day, I still don't understand. But that's probably why most Jet fans don't have a problem with Giants fans. Right, you know, we're both uh, we're both sharing the uh, shithole that we play in. Excuse me, pardon my French, but uh, I mean, you're not wrong. There's that. a U- there's a jet YouTuber that I follow that he basically calls MetLife the biggest air conditioning unit in the world. Accurate, very yeah. accurate. I mean, it's such a bland stadium, like it really is. Mm-hmm. And the fact that it hosts two teams, like you said, from two different conferences, it's just it's just uh, it's just something that you would never see in baseball, never see in football, you know, never see in basketball, you know. So I digress. This is a hockey podcast. We we got carried away. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if we've gotten very carried away on intros before. So we have. Wouldn't be the first time. Yeah. That's uh, that's honestly what I love. We bullshit for like three, four minutes and then we actually get into hockey talk. If it, yeah, everybody, everybody who's listening for the first time, like you can just skip ahead in the timestamps to the hockey portion and skip the intro if you want. I really don't mind. I'm just happy that you watch. I and I appreciate it very much. Same with me. All right, so let's go into the hockey podcast. So we got some uh, cool stats to talk about. First and foremost, Alex Ovechkin, thirty goal season again. For the seventeenth time, <laughs> I mean, he tied Mike Bossy for the record, right? For thirty goal seasons, I believe he did. Yes, with this uh, with this season. My God, I mean, dude, it's been so awesome to watch Ovechkin. Like it really I, has been. I'm just gonna read it off, Shades. Every single year since Alexander Ovechkin entered the league in 0506, the goals he has put up, not assists, just goals: fifty-two, forty-six, sixty-five. 56, 50, 32, 38, 32. Slow down for a few years there. 51, 53, 50, 33, 49, 51, 48, 24 in a shortened season, 50, and now 30, and we're not even at the all-star break. I mean, oh, my God. I mean, just longevity. You know, we've talked about it, you know, in past podcasts, but uh, you can just not underestimate the impact that Alex Ovechkin has had on the game of hockey and uh, continues to grow every day. He's at 810 goals. He's only 84 goals away. He's close. Not this season, but next season, maybe the year after that. We'll see. My God, dude. I mean, I'm just looking like I, I looked up Mike Bossy stats when you were uh, going through Ovechkin stats and excuse me one second while I take a sip of my uh, cold brew from Duncan still not sponsored unfortunately but Bossy had 10 or excuse me nine straight 50 goal seasons and he had I'll go you know I'll just list them off while we're at it 53 69 nice 61 I mean excuse me 51 68 64, 60, 51, 58, 61. That was his nine-year stretch. And he only played for 
Wow, he only played for the Islanders for 10 years. Yeah, Mike Bossy's career was a little bit more premature than uh, some of the other goal scorers, you know, around the league. And, you know, I would combat what you said, Shades, and, you know, at the risk of upsetting, you know, those who are able to watch Mike Bossy live. I just think, you know, during the time in which Alexander Ovechkin has played in the NHL, it's simply harder to score goals. And, you know, I mean, when I'm just looking at his career high season of 65 goals in 07, 08, and then 10 years later in 2018, 2019, 51 goals. I mean, just goes to show you, it doesn't matter what era he's necessarily playing in. And as his career has continued and as goal scoring has become more difficult, Alexander Ovechkin has gotten better. And uh, it's really a shame that Mike Bossy's career was as short as it was because we'd love to see uh, what he would have, you know, continued to do uh, throughout the, you know, remainder of his career. But, uh, you know, as far as the discussion goes, I think Alexander Ovechkin is the greatest goal scorer of all time and has a realistic chance of getting to a thousand goals if he can stay healthy. Knock on wood. Yeah, no, I'm just going to bring this up real quick because I was having this conversation like two to three weeks ago. Uh, It was a discussion about like uh, Gretzky, Howe, and Ovechkin, and like which is the greatest goal scorer of all time. And I was thinking about this particular thing yesterday. It was like, Howe played in the most physical era, like the most physically tough era to play in, but Ovechkin is playing in the most skilled era. So I mean, you can make a legit, you can make a legitimate argument based on that point alone that Ovechkin is the greatest goal scorer. Then again, it this is all I, I kind of get. This is all kind of subjective for certain people because you know people have different viewpoints on this stuff. Now he's the greatest goal scorer I will ever lay my eyes on. I truly think uh, that is true. Um, and again. We'll just see where it goes, you know, from here as far as the career of Alexander Ovechkin. I mean, he's still, I mean, look, what, how old is he right now? I mean, he's, he was born, dude, he's 37. He's 37 and he's not slowing down. His last full season, he played 77 out of 82 games, 50 goals. What, what part of that, you know, says that he's going to slow down? He's on pace for 50 goals right now, 30 goals through 47 games. And he's going to be 38. You know, age is just a number with some athletes, with a very limited number of athletes. I think Tom Brady is one. I think Alex Ovechkin is another. Well, I guess Tom Brady, you know, back to the football talk, I guess maybe that could have been the end for Tom. But, uh, you know, it's a conversation for another day. Um, But there's no reason for me to think that Alex Ovechkin cannot continue this torrid pace, you know, for years to come. Yeah, and it's been, like I said earlier, it's just been absolutely spectacular to watch. It has. It's really been a pleasure, you know, and I think there's something, you know, to shades what you were talking about with the most skilled era. If you're the best goal scorer in the most skilled era in hockey history, I think that lays it out flat on the table for you. That that says everything that you need to know about Alex Ovechkin and what he's done, you know, and like Gordie Howe and Wayne Gretzky, you know, who dominated in different eras. You know, I think you got to look at it from a little bit of a different perspective than you do with the grade eight. Yep. I mean, yeah, personally, I think Ovi is the greatest goal scorer of all time, but I just, I want him to break Gretzky's record just so like more people will hopefully settle on that viewpoint. Right on. All right. So keeping it in the Metro for a second, dude, the New Jersey Devils, their road record is just absolutely insane. Through, I saw a stat the other day through their first 20 road games this season, they had 17 wins, which top, which actually broke the NHL record of 16 by by both the 2019-20 Washington Capitals, which I completely forgot about that one, the 2012-13 Chicago Blackhawks, which I remember vividly, and the 29-30, 1929-30 Boston Bruins. Mm-hmm. And the sad part is they are not even first in the Metro right now. That would be Carolina, correct? Yes. Now, get rid of NHL. Please get rid of the loser point, but that's another discussion for another day. But I guess the question is, are the Devils, would you consider the Devils still contenders 
knowing that they gave up that sizable division lead. They're a good story, Shades. They're a fun story. But once they get to the playoffs, it's a different animal. And once you get to the playoffs, you know what you need to take advantage of more than anything? Home ice advantage. And as impressive as 18-2-1 on the road is this season, 11-10-1, 11-10-2, excuse me, at home is flat out pedestrian. And if you cannot turn that around by the time the postseason comes along, I'm admittedly, you know, even as a Ranger fan, unbiased perspective, I'm a little bit wary about how far the Devils can go. I think that they'll get in. They might get in as, you know, they'll definitely get in as at least a wild card, might be third or even second in the division. I don't think that they'll win the division, but uh, I think that they're going to get knocked out in the first round, possibly by a team that has a little bit more postseason experience, has been there before. But with that said, the New Jersey Devils are coming. And even though this year isn't the year that they're necessarily going to get it out of the first round, I think, you know, in years to come, I think that they definitely are going to be a force to be reckoned with in the Eastern Conference. But you got to figure out how to win on home ice shades. That's just it. Yes. Yes, you do. Now, I have a very distinct difference between playoff contenders and cup contenders. New Jersey, I definitely don't see them as a cup contender. Playoff contender, though, absolutely. You can't deny that after how they started the season and their road record. Uh, Just the like Boston, that's a cup contender. New Jersey, a playoff contender. Maybe they win around. Yeah, but hey, that still eighteen two and one, like you just said, that's still an incredible road record. That kind of reminds me of Vegas's home record a couple years back when in their first year. Yep. And, you know, it's it's a little bit odd, right? You know, we can't really figure out an answer uh, as to why the Devils are as dominant on the road. And it's just not the same at, at home. I mean, is there more pressure playing at the Prudential Center? I mean, I don't really get it. I mean, I haven't watched the Devils the whole season, so I can't really dissect their play, you know, playing on the road versus playing at home. But it's really an interesting conundrum. It, it genuinely is. And if you look at the last time that the Devils made the playoff shades, that was 2017, 2018. And they had a really nice season. Taylor Hall won the Hart Trophy that year. And they got bounced in five games by the Tampa Bay Lightning. And quite frankly, I could see the same thing happening this year, no matter who their opponent is. A good story, a nice up and coming team, not ready to take that next step. Yeah, I agree with you. And look at the Rangers in the bubble. Sorry, look at the Rangers in the bubble in 2020. I don't. I didn't need to be reminded of that. Of that, Liam. God damn it! (laughs) I kind of reminded myself, brought the pain back. But again, they were a young, up and coming team, and they just got bounced by a team with more veteran experience, a team that they would go on to beat two years later in the semifinals. You know, in the Carolina Hurricanes. So their time is coming. It is. It's just you got to lose before you win, and I think that's what the Devils are going to experience. Yeah, I'm still confused how the Rangers won against Carolina with how that series went. (laughs) I just think Carolina just grossly underperformed. I don't think the Rangers outplayed them. I just think Carolina just beat themselves. But again. Yeah, no, I would agree with you on that one. But uh, you brought this up earlier and specifically the two words, good story. Uh, Speaking of good stories, dude, the Seattle Kraken men. I mean, holy crap. They just won eight games in a row before losing to Tampa. I think it was on Monday night. And they swept 7-0 and on a seven-game road trip, which is – did that tie or did that break the NHL record? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. But definitely came close. Yeah, I mean – If it didn't. Dude, just look at this. They're second in the Pacific Division after that, just behind Vegas. And they have 26 wins, which is tied for third in the entire Western Conference. Hey, man, look, I'll give Seattle a lot of credit right now. Like, I haven't been able to watch basically any of their games because, you know, they play at like 10 o'clock every night on the East Coast, and I I can't stay up most of the time anymore because getting old sucks. But, I mean, look at where they were last year after the expansion draft, comparing them solely to Vegas. They were looked at as a team that is going to take a multi-year growing process. I don't want to specifically use rebuild because the team is brand new. So they haven't really haven't gotten there yet, but you look at where they were 
and look at the moves they made over the offseason. You and I were both talking about, you know, they acquired some good players. We'll give them credit. These were good moves. But at the same time, we didn't think that it was going to be a major leap forward for them. We kind of thought it was just going to be baby steps. But the fact that they're right in the thick of a playoff spot right now, and I can pretty confidently say at this point that they have a very good chance of making the playoffs, and I think they will. It's, like you said, good story. And what would you like to say about them? Yeah, I got a lot to say about the Seattle Kraken. And before this 8-2-0, 10-game stretch that they had, of course, the eight-game winning streak on the road, they were 18-12-4. and four. That's only eight, you know, 18 and 16. You're only two games over 500, you know, and there were a lot of people around the NHL who are just kind of writing them off and saying, all right, well, this team has come back down to earth. Like you said, Jades, good story in the beginning of the year. But of course, when you have a young team, you know, not an experienced team, you're going to falter come the middle of the season once, you know, the pomp and circumstance of the beginning of the year kind of wears off. But then the 8 2 0 stretch. They're 26, 14, and four shades. They are a playoff contender. They are not a cup contender, but let me run through why the Seattle Kraken are where they are. First and foremost, the acquisition that they made in the, in the, excuse me, in the off season, Oliver Bjorkstrand is one of the best two-way players in the national hockey league. And that was a mistake for Columbus to give up on him. And, you know, it was kind of a cat move, right? You have yeah. When uh, I remember like when that happened, I was like, Columbus, you done messed up. Yeah, messed up seriously. And uh, Bjorkstrand's been really good for them. You know, some players that were on the team last year, Vince Dunn, Yanni Gord, both having really nice seasons. Adam Larson, probably one of, uh, a part of one of the most lopsided trades in NHL history. He's a staple in that top four on the defense. Let's give him credit where it's due. He might not have been great, you know, on Edmonton, but he's been really uh, a solid addition for Seattle. You know, I could run through. Ellie Tovenin, you take advantage of the waiver wire. You know, you're utilizing his shot now, you know. Ellie Tovenin has one positive thing about his game one plus part of his uh game of hockey and that is his shot nashville never used it and what did seattle do they're putting him on the power play setting him up in the circle and teeing him up for one timers and he's been great shades maddie beneers He's one of the few rookies that was drafted in the last two years that's actually living up to expectations and actually performing as a top line player. And one last player to talk about, because I think he deserves a ton of credit shades. Martin Jones has turned around his career in Seattle. And you know what? If it was Philip Grubauer and maybe a different veteran backup, I'm not sure Seattle's sitting where they are right now, second in the Pacific division. Martin Jones deserves a ton of credit. He was really good as a backup in Philadelphia. Nobody really noticed it. He signed a deal with the, you know, a lot of goaltenders with the Seattle Kraken, you know, Chris Drieger, you know, Philip Grubauer, you know, Joey Decord was there as well. Vitek Vanacek before he got traded and he has made himself the guy for the Kraken. So it's a whole team effort. You really got to love to see it. I, I'm really excited for the Kraken and their fans really am. Yeah. I'm honestly glad that we've gotten two expansion teams or the last two, I should say that we've actually had early success with them. It's actually really nice to see compared to, old teams like from late nineties, early two thousands, like the predators and the blue jackets, where it took a couple of years for them to get going. Absolutely. Yeah. No doubt about it. And you know, it's just great seeing their success and I'm excited for the outdoor outdoor game between Vegas and Seattle. That's upcoming. Yes. That's going to be fun. As soon as they announced that, I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> Expansion outdoor game. That's sick. It's a lot of fun. Oh, hell yeah. I was hyped. And anybody who doesn't like that matchup, I don't want to see the same goddamn teams every year. Exactly. That's why I'm not upset about the Rangers, you know, not being in an outdoor game in yeah. several seasons, you know. Let's give them their break. You know, their time will come. Big market. Hey. Let's give some other teams a chance. Hey, uh, Rangers, uh, they had Winter Classic in 2012, the two outdoor, the stadium series games in 2013, 2014, and the Winter Classic in 2018. So, yeah, We're doing all right. Classic. I forgot about that one. We're doing all right. We're doing all right. The Miller overtime goal. That was fun. Yes. Never. I was never so happy to be jumping around in a circle with a complete group of strangers. And never did I think I would be as excited to beat Buffalo. But uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, lastly, just because you brought up Tolvanen, to quote Key and Peel, Nashville, you done messed up, A.A. Ron. <laughs> Yep, absolutely. David Poyle, don't know what he's thinking. I think his time might be up in uh, 
in Nashville. It's the longest uh, the tenured general manager in the National Hockey League, and mm-hmm. there's been a number of decisions here that are head scratchers, and Tolvanen is a big one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And since we brought up Seattle, I'm going to move on to the other division in the Western Conference, and that's the Central. Now, there's a couple things about this that we wanted to talk about specifically within this division. We, I know you definitely wanted to talk about Colorado possibly not making the playoffs. Let's so let's start with that. This See? team is riddled by injuries. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. They are. And, you know, it's a possibility. And it's pretty crazy to think that a team that won the Stanley Cup last season is, you know, borderline, you know, not going to make the playoffs. I mean, it's early and they have suffered a lot of injuries and they just got Val Nachushkin back and they just got Nathan McKinnon back about a week and a half ago. They're starting to get reinforcements. But I'm just saying three, six and one in your last 10 for a majority of those 10 games, Nathan McKinnon was playing, you know, and I, I just don't. Something just doesn't seem right. It's not Georgiev. I looked at the stats for Alexander Georgiev. He might not be winning a lot of games, but he has a goals against average sub 2-8, and he has a save percentage of 915. So I don't really know what the problem is. I love Jared Bednar as a head coach. I think that he's great, but Shades, it's something more than injuries here. I mean, what do you think? Well, I mean, they were kind of forced to make a decent amount of changes last year because that was kind of their... I don't want to say last chance to win, but that was kind of their last chance to keep that powerhouse team together, like everyone on that team. Because losing Kadri, I think, hurt them more than people were going to give it, give that credit for, that loss for. But here's a fun, fun fact. the As much as Colorado has underperformed this season, they're four points out of a playoff spot with games in hand on the wild card teams. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's certainly a positive. And and their record 22 17 and 3. Which honestly, if you were going to tell me that they had a winning record at this point with how their season has gone, I honestly would have this that actually did surprise me right now when I looked up their record. I just think it was so odd shades just for a team that was so dominant, you know, last year. And, you know, again, even with some injured pieces, I mean, it's just 22 wins in 42 games. I just, just something, something gets me about that. You know, their goal differential, they're a plus 10, you know, so they're the only plus team uh, that is outside of the playoffs right now in the central division. So, I mean, there are signs of a turnaround. I'm just, I just don't know. I just think that we should start implanting it in our brains as fans, as people who talk about the league, that it is a realistic possibility for this team to make the playoffs just a year after winning the Stanley cup. I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, actually, the last team to win the Cup and not make the playoffs the next year was the 2015 Los Angeles Kings, which, oh my God, just how? But this is a completely different situation. That team, I I don't even know. That team just completely fell off a cliff. At least the Avalanche have a reason to be bad this year for underperforming. And it's weird because the Kings kind of came out of nowhere, you know, both years that they won the cup in 2012 and 2014. And, uh, you know, then like you said, they fell off a cliff. So again, two different teams and, you know, we bring up the Kings because it really hasn't happened a lot in NHL history. You know, I probably count on one finger, how many times on one hand, rather how many times the team won the Stanley cup and missed the playoffs the next year. But uh, again, they'll probably turn it around, but I think three, six and one in their last 10 is noteworthy. I do. Yeah. So moving on to, the next topic of the central division you asked me this like probably 20 minutes before we started recording who do you think is the best team in the central right now and i might have to go winnipeg jets (laughs) it's tough shades it's a process of elimination right you know you look at the stars who are 26, 12, and 7. i mean they're 6 3 and 1 in their last 10 they've been really good jake ottinger is a vesna candidate But you know who has all of it in one? The good defense, the solid head coaching, the offensive punch, and the elite goaltender? It's Winnipeg. Yeah. It's the Winnipeg Jets. I think they're the best team in the division. But it's, you know, 
Do you think a team like Colorado or a St. Louis could make their way back into the playoffs? Because they both sit at 47 points. Of course, Colorado, like you mentioned, Shades, has three games in hand on St. Louis. But again, these are teams that we've seen make comebacks late in the season before. I know we talk about it a lot. I know every hockey fan talks about it a lot when they see their fa- uh, their team far out of the playoffs. The St. Louis Blues in 2019, you know, they were a bottom feeder. Then suddenly they snuck into the playoffs and won the Stanley Cup. So I don't know. Do you think that the Jets or the Stars have this division on lock or do you think somebody else could uh, could get there? Well, Minnesota's not too far behind them. They're five points behind, but they also have two games in hand. But I think the tipping point for me is looking specifically at the record. Winnipeg only has one overtime loss. Dallas has seven and Minnesota has four. Dallas cannot win in overtime. It's a, it's an yep. issue. No, uh, this just brings up again, the NHL needs to get rid of the loser point, but we'll have a in-depth discussion on that later in the year. For but... me, Sheets, I just look at the Minnesota Wild and I just don't see a goaltending tandem that's going to win you a Stanley Cup. Same. I'm sorry. Marc-Andre Fleury is over the hill. He's a, he's a 1B at best best a 1b on a playoff contending team not a stanley cup contending team nashville didn't we think that nashville was going to be in some sort of rebuild or retool you know they've kind of hung around but i don't think they're a contender the abs we just talked about the blues you know they have three more games played than the abs who they're currently chasing down so that's a little bit of a question mark and then uh the coyotes and blackhawks who are just horrible so i mean it's really, really tough, but I'd hedge my money on the Winnipeg Jets, just the most complete team. But I think Dallas deserves some credit, too. Yeah, and I actually, I remember, because you brought up the 2019 St. Louis Blues, I remember Doug Armstrong, their GM, saying that in 28, like going into the 2018 trade deadline, he didn't make a move or like a massive move because he didn't like the way that the team was playing. And that team had the better record at that point in the season, or at least going into the new year. And then the next year he admitted that even though the team was crap, they, he liked the way that they were playing. So he was, he was uh, more confident in making moves. And well, look what happened. They ended up winning the Stanley cup. So that resonated with me last year with the Rangers because I'm just like, this team is overperforming for the way that they're playing. And then this year they're playing better. And the record is sort of showing it. So yes, you just never know. You just, you just never know. Like you said, the Kings came out of nowhere in 2012. Other teams we thought were over the hill and won a.k.a. the 2018 Washington Capitals. So, yeah, sometimes you just got to trust your general manager, even though there's only one winner every year. But I will give Winnipeg credit. They completely turned their season around compared to where they were last year. You know, Winnipeg made incremental moves, small, minute changes to their roster and their coaching staff in the offseason. It wasn't anything flashy. And I think Rick Bonus coming in and subsequently Paul Maurice going to Florida, we could talk about that, uh, really changed the trajectory of each franchise. And now Winnipeg is a team that is utilizing their strengths. What are their strengths? Speed, defense, goaltending and all three of those are at an elite level kyle connor and nikolai ehlers i mean i mean they that might be the most underrated duo in the league i mean you know so i love what winnipeg is doing i agree with what you said about the general manager discussion it's gonna be very interesting to see how chris drury approaches this trade deadline for the rangers versus how he did last year i think that there might be one big move instead of multiple small ones but again we'll see once that time comes but as far as the central division shades I'm trying to find that team, that team that you were talking about, that team that's in the bottom right now that might just dig their way out and get themselves on a run. And, you know, Colorado and the Blackhawks are not those teams. St. Louis, you know, Colorado, they won the Stanley Cup, so it wouldn't really be a shock if they got there. I guess the Predators. 
I guess the Predators in the wild, hey, the Predators are keeping themselves in the conversation. And all you need is a good, hot goaltender, you know, to make a run in the playoffs. And they got one in UC Soros. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know who it's going to be. Uh, but as far as right now, I can tell you that the Jets, Stars, in the wild, whatever order you want to put them in, I think are going to end up the top three in the Central at season's end. Yeah, I don't see a team coming out of nowhere. But if there's a team that is currently not in a playoff position that I could see getting in, it, it it's probably Colorado. Yeah, Colorado for sure. Yeah, you know, because I'll... because Edmonton and Calgary are just massively underperforming. Oh, okay, well, Calgary is massively underperforming. We all knew the overall Edmonton team stunk, but go ahead. Right, no. I had nothing more to add. I totally agree. Did I steal what you were going to say? Kind of, but it's okay. Okay, sorry <laughs> about that. It's just, it's it's two good minds thinking alike, that's all. Yeah. All right, and uh, lastly, let's move on to a central team that we just mentioned, the Chicago Blackhawks. Now, Another thing you texted me before we started recording is that Kane voiced it, or was possibly voicing his frustration. What exactly happened there? Because I uh, didn't Taves. hear about this. Taves. Taves, sorry. Did, did I just uh, say Caves or Kane? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you said Kane, maybe a hybrid of Kane and Taves. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. This is why I got the coffee. <laughs> That's why you got the coffee. Um, I don't really remember what the specific conversation was about, but I think it was uh, a media scrum and Taze was just asked about his future with the team and Taze openly admitted and, and said, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, but, you know, said, look, it might be time to move on. You know, and I think the I'm not really surprised that those, you know, that he said that, but I think just coming out of his mouth and him being open about his frustration. Look, we've never heard a peep out of Patrick Kane saying that he's frustrated with what's going on in Chicago. But this is the second or third time now where Jonathan Tace has kind of insinuated that maybe it's time for the relationship to just break apart. Um, yeah. And I just found that very interesting. And if Taze feels that way and Kane has never, like I said, come out publicly and said this, but if Taze feels that way as a veteran, as a player who won the Stanley cup with this franchise has been with this franchise, his entire career, you have to think that Patrick Kane is tra is feeling the same way. And I would be stunned if both of them aren't moved by the deadline, a little I lesser to a degree, Patrick Kane, but uh, I think they're both going to be gone. Now, I have a theory that one one of these two, I'm more so like heavily leaning towards Taves, is going to be involved in a three-team trade to get the cap hit even lower than 50% for the team that's going to end up with him. Because, look, Jonathan Taves is a good player, but... At the same time, if you're retaining 50% for a 5.25 mil cap hit, that's that's a lot to ask for a team that's trying to make that one last move because most of the teams don't have that cap space. And Shades, on that note, there are only a few teams who can afford to make that move, yeah. even at 50%. One of them is the Rangers, and the Rangers, you know, they have a they lot don't of need options. a center. And Taze is not going to be at the top of their list. You know, Kane might be, but, and the other teams that have the cap space are teams that aren't really contending. You know, you look at your Buffalo Sabres, you know, who have been in the conversation, but they've really struggled recently. Are they a playoff contending team? I don't think so. I mean, you could think differently, but I don't think so right now. So which team is going to shell out that money? I just don't know. And like you said, it could be a third party that comes in and helps alleviate a little bit of the cap hit. But Taze, I want to know your thoughts. Uh, wow. Taze, Shades, I want to know your opinion on this. You messed up with the Kane thing. I messed up with the Taze. Whatever. We move on. You cut it out. You don't cut it out. Well, I feel um, like somebody tased my brain with the with my ability to think every time we record a podcast. So. Right. <laughs> but my thing is, you know, I think that Jonathan Taze right now is a third line center on a cup contending team. And does a cup contending team pay five point two five million for a third line center? And yeah, no, who hasn't really produced a lot of points. I don't know. Patrick Kane is easily the more valuable commodity if I am a team wanting to trade with the Chicago Blackhawks. So, the, so the, the Hawks are going to have to sweeten the pot a little bit. Now, remember, like I said, like two minutes ago, the three-team trade idea? Yeah. I can see Winnipeg making that happen. 
Winnipeg has not shied away from trading for centers at the deadline in years they've contended. I'll give you Kevin Hayes um, at the deadline back in 2018. But yeah, they could be interesting. Again, if you want to win in the playoffs, you got to build through the middle, you know? And I think Jonathan Taze really does add to that. I think if they got themselves a little closer to playoff contention, I think the Islanders could be interested in Jonathan Taze. I mean, why not add one more older guy uh, to this roster of old, old, old players that the Islanders keep putting out there? Great job, Lou Amarillo. You know, I think a young team like the Seattle Kraken, who has a lot of cap space, they could be interested if they're contending. Imagine adding Jonathan Taze to that forward group, how much that does for a team that's never made the playoffs, you know, and only their second years of existence. So, Again, so many avenues, but uh, maybe the Devils. You know, I know they have Jack Hughes and Nico Heischer, but you know who would slot in really nicely on the third line there? Jonathan Taze would be a pretty good mentor for two up-and-coming young centers. So uh, uh, the possibilities are endless. But what I can tell you, Shades, is that Jonathan Taze will not be a New York Ranger, I can tell you that. Oh, yeah, no. That, <laughs> yeah, no, that's not happening unless – I mean, we would literally have to trade Goodrow. And I don't know if Drury wants – Taves on his fourth line or because because you'd have to move somebody down to the it's fourth gotta be line a, it's got to be a winger yeah yeah and yeah that's it we'll we'll circle back <clears throat> to that for sure we will definitely circle back to that yeah but Kane I would uh I would gladly accept Patty Kane at 5.25 yeah I think if, many teams would if you could make that work and I 100% agree with you Kane definitely has more trade value The problem with Taves is his trade value is going to get inflated because of his leadership, you know, off on ice leadership. And you and I have talked about this before. You know that when it comes to that specific aspect of a player and the inflation of the trade value, I think that's complete and total bullshit how that inflates a player's on ice trade value. The Rangers traded a third round pick for Ryan Reeves and he was not worth the third round pick. I agree. And that Um, was just a small trade. And I think, you know, Taze at 5.25 million for the points, the points that he has produced in the last few years, I still think that's an overpayment. And, you know, if it wasn't for that leadership and if it wasn't for those years winning the Stanley Cup with the Blackhawks, I don't think any team would come calling Chicago asking for Taze. So uh, I think that that's the only thing that really keeps him marketable because, you know, for other teams, because I don't think that uh, he is the point producer that he once was. And I don't think the acquiring team come the trade deadline can expect him to be that, which is why third line center is the only spot I can really put him in. He wins faceoffs at an elite rate. He helps drive the play, but he's not scoring anymore. And how much are you going to pay for a center who doesn't score and just wins faceoffs? Eh, maybe five point seven five million, right? Vincent Trocheck. <laughs> well, yeah, Trocheck just, does just spend that a lot. <laughs> yeah, he does. Miss. But so did Strom. I guess all centers just mean yeah. Them. So switching back to a Pacific team for a second, because I know we both wanted to touch on this one. You said that Jim Rutherford of the Vancouver Canucks had some comments about the quote unquote retool, and. My my good sir, I call bullshit on retool. <laughs> what were his comments? You hate the term retool. I know you know that. Um, well, I'm going to go through a number of the comments that he, he made because a number of them stood off the page. The first one, he said, and I quote, I'm disappointed in the job I've done to this point. So he acknowledges they're in the bottom of the Pacific Division. It's my fault. Can he please acknowledge that he ruined a cup contending Penguins team for no reason also? Almost. Almost ruined. Yeah, I mean... No, he did ruin. They haven't won a playoff series in five years. You said it. (laughs) Uh, He said, we're not moving towards a rebuild. I prefer the term retool. He says that his preference is younger NHL players rather than draft picks. Thoughts, good sir. Oh, wait, there's more. Do you want to hear more? Oh, yeah, please. He said, I'll say the obvious. We want the first overall pick this year of all years. So, sir, are you telling me that you are tanking? You you are openly telling us that you want to lose. And he also said, I thought we were tanking. We're pretty close to the bottom. That was an actual quote. And when he was asked about the future of Bruce Boudreau uh, behind the bench, yeah, they weren't uh, they weren't very kind. He said, and I quote, all I can say is Bruce is our coach right now, but with that, I'm calling and talking, but don't know that we're making a change and don't know that we want to make a change. 
what? And then his last comment, and this is about Bo Horvat and the contract situation. I believe we've taken our best shot on Bo Horvat with the offer we have on the table right now. It's fair value for what he's done up to this year. We're in a pickle here. He's had a career run and he's looking for his money. That's the only quote I can agree with. Everything else is utter blasphemy. Thoughts? This guy traded for Oliver Ekman Larson and gave JT Miller a completely <laughs> undeserved massive contract extension that is going to hamper both of those moves are going to hamper this team for the next four to five years at the minimum. And having players like Bo Horvat, like Brock Besser, like Quinn Hughes, like Elias Pettersson, like Thatcher Demko. This guy has not been able to build the team around those guys. And the team is stuck in that dreaded middle of the pack where they're not good enough to put themselves in a position to get a top five pick most years, but they're also not good enough to make the playoffs on a consistent basis. And he kind of contradicted himself there saying, we don't want draft picks. We want young NHL players. But then he immediately said, this is the year we want the first overall pick. If you don't, you want draft picks. I mean, you don't want draft picks, You want, but you want young NHL players, but you want the first overall pick this year. Like, which one is it? You're muted. Sorry, I'm muted. Um, <laughs> I can I can understand wanting Connor Bedard. You know, I can draw the line there. I mean, Connor Bedard is a generational talent. I mean, I'm pretty sure whoever the general manager at the time of the 2013 2014 Edmonton Oilers were probably saying the same thing about Connor McDavid. So, but he did contradict himself. I will agree there. And he has made some absolutely abysmal decisions while at the head of the Vancouver Canucks. But shades. This entire discussion and all the quotes I just read out to you, it only confirms to Canuck fans specifically what they have had to endure their entire fandom. Not once in the history of the Vancouver Canucks has their upper management ever had a long-term plan. They made the Stanley Cup in 1994. They made the Stanley Cup in 2011, but it wasn't because of the decisions from up top. I can tell you that, you know, so... They have never executed a rebuild from the bottom. And it's unfortunate that I'm saying this shades at this point in the season, because the Canucks and their roster were one that I really, really liked going into the year. It's time to tear it all down outside of Quinn Hughes, Elias Pettersson, and possibly Thatcher Demko. It's time. Everybody else has to go. If you can even get anything for JT Miller and his, what, eight and a half, nine million dollar cap hit that they just signed him to coming off a career season, I, I, I just, you know, it's a mess. It's a mess. And it's time for them to be honest with their fans, like the Rangers general manager and their upper management were way back when they started their rebuild and say, look, a lot of these faces you love. They're not going to be around anymore. It's time to tear it down and do things the right way and the rangers are proof that if you just do things the right way things will fall into your lap and there can be a better future because of it but now see the only difference between the rangers and the canucks is the rangers had made like previous moves prior to going full rebuild like the zabanajad trade which that alone put them way ahead of schedule and let's be honest with right now, like the Rangers are way ahead of where they should be because they went full on rebuild and they're way ahead of where they should be because they look, they had a plan Canucks. Like you said, they definitely do not have a plan. They've never had a plan. I mean, they have Ilya Mikheyev and Connor Garland, both making just under 5 million and not for nothing, but both guys haven't exactly worked because it's Vancouver. I'd argue Mikheyev has had a, a decent year, but again, it's a long-term contract with a guy who doesn't have much of a track record. And you yeah. know what makes the Connor Garland? No, Mikheyev was decent on uh, Toronto. Yeah, he was. Um, 
But yeah, as far as the Connor Garland point that you made, you know, that was really the reason. And I think if you ask Jim Rutherford what the reason was, why they pulled the trigger on the Oliver Ekman Larson trade, it was two reasons. So you could get out of Louis Erickson's contract and that you could bring back in a restricted free agent at the time, a restricted free agent in Car- Connor Garland, who again, just had a career year in Arizona, a team that didn't have many top line players and were relying on Connor Garland to put the puck in the back of the net. So now you put $9 million into two players that don't have a, a big track record. You put another $9 million into JT Miller, who yes, is coming off a 95 plus point season last year, but again, no track record of success. It is. It, it is a mess in Vancouver. And the only answer is shades, even if it takes five, six, seven years or takes as long as it's taken teams like the Buffalo Sabres, just do it. Just do it. Just bite the bullet and do it. And going back to what you said about the Rangers and how they had Mika Zibanejad, let's give the Canucks a little bit of credit here. Let's not pretend like they have a roster full of nobodies. They have three young players at three premium positions that if they start a rebuild and keep those guys around, there's, there's a foundation there. Quinn Hughes creates a foundation. Elias Pettersson creates a foundation. For as poor as he's played this season, I still think Thatcher Demko creates a foundation in net. So the answer is clear, in my opinion. Okay, yeah, that's a that's a fair point. But at the same time, though, here's the, here's the only problem. You look at the Rangers roster right now, a lot of them or a lot of the big names were acquired via trade or free agency. You look at the Canucks, they've like their top players, they drafted and they've whiffed on basically everything else. So they're basically opposite Rangers. They are opposite Rangers, but you know, I mean, yes, the Rangers have had more success and they are in a far, far, far better spot than the Vancouver Canucks are. I'd rather have success drafting players than have success signing the right players. And that might be a hot take, but I think that it's it says more about the Canucks that they were able to draft three players in Demko, Hughes, and Pedersen that all worked out. That was not a great draft class, you know, in 2017 when Elias Pedersen, you know, was selected. Well, actually, the- it wasn't the uh... – that draft class in general wasn't great at the time, but that it that draft class has actually aged pretty nicely. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about, yeah, some of the top 10 picks. Leah Sanderson was in there. You know, there was, of course, your top 10s, you know, they're always going to have your busts. But oh, I'm yeah. just saying that the Canucks, you know, they've drafted well. And, you know, if you don't sign the right players, you know, you can't really foresee how a player is going to perform, you know, when they come to town. I mean, Mark Messier, if you want to keep it on the Canucks, you know, discussion when they signed Mark Messier, that was possibly one of the you know worst decisions in Canucks history. But I do agree with you that they are opposite Rangers. Um, but I think the fact that they were able to draft well, scout well and develop their players well, that bodes well uh, for a future rebuild. That's just my point. Yeah. And also, like you just you have to make the right trades like along oh, yeah. the way in the rebuild absolutely so that, like that's another that that's another key aspect that i just don't have faith in because even though technically jim rutherford isn't the general manager he's the head of hockey operations and he probably has a say in most of slash all of the moves like it was a mistake bringing him in there from vancouver's ownership standpoint and they're gonna pay the consequences They certainly are. And, you know, I go back to the beginning of the rebuild, right? And you talked about earlier that the one game-changing move that the Rangers made, the one game-changing trade that the Rangers made was acquiring Mika Zibanejad and a second round for Derek Broussard. At the time, Shades, Ranger fans were not happy about that move. Actually, funny enough, I actually, I didn't hate the trade at all. I actually kind of liked it. I will right. say that on record. And there are and there are people like you, you know, who did like the trade at the time. But I'm just coming from the perspective of you have Derek Broussard, who's been a playoff, I guess you could say hero for your team, yeah. you know, yeah. during the, you know, successful years that they had. And it wasn't a window that the Rangers were necessarily ready to close. They weren't ready to close it on Derek Broussard and, you know, uh, excuse me. Yeah, Derek Broussard and Derek Stepan and all these veterans who were a part of this, you know, success that the Rangers were able to grow in the postseason in the late 2010s. But it was a risky move. You brought in a younger player. 
The second round pick didn't turn itself into anything, but what happened, right? Derek Broussard became a third line center, you know, a veteran third line guy. And he's still to his credit, a third, fourth line guy. I think he's still playing in the NHL this season. Um, and Mika Zibanejad is a superstar first line center. So I think when you look at a player, if you're the Vancouver Canucks and Jim Rutherford, like a Bo Horvat, who is your captain, who you do have to resign, I think you, without a doubt, move on from him, get a younger player and hope that what Jim Rutherford is saying about acquiring younger players, uh, you know, can help them out in their subsequent rebuild or retool. And, yeah. <laughs> as he calls it. Freaking just, they need to go full on rebuild. See, Boston went through a retool a few years ago. That was a legitimate retool where they, I think they missed the playoffs for two straight, like they barely missed the playoffs for two straight years, but then they were back to being a scary team come playoff time. That is the definition of a retool. Whatever's going on in Vancouver is not. And Vancouver's never been a scary playoff team. Except tw- of- except uh, 2011. 2011 and outside of that nice little run they had in the bubble, but that's that's it. And you got to take that with a grain of salt. So yep. it's comparing apples and oranges. Yep. That's what. And to uh, just to end this on Bo Horvat, they ownership has made it clear they're not willing to pay him. And I think that relationship is just fried, especially after the JT Miller contract. So, yeah, just cu- just cut bait, start over, burn everything down. The JT Miller contract was the the eight move. million a year through twenty thirty. Insane, absolutely insane. And that said, to both and work. people and people want a higher cap. It no, we don't need a higher cap. It you need smarter general managers. But let me also say, Shades, I do think that Jim Rutherford passing or not, you know, budging on his contract offer to Bo Horvat is a pretty good idea. I could see Bo Horvat getting signed eight plus million dollars a year in unrestricted free agency. And that after a few years kind of looking like not the best deal in the world. Bo Horvat entered uh, the NHL in 2014, 2015. So this are his points. From that, uh, from 2014 up until now, 25, 40, 52, 44, 61, 53, 39, 52, 48, and he's got 48 right now through 43 games. It scares me. It scares me, and I think the Canucks are. I don't know. I don't know who they'd be better off with long term. J.T. Miller or Bo, Bo Horvat. Horvat. That could be a conversation. <laughs> I mean, but I, yeah, and I would agree it's Horvat because just based off of the reason, the sole reason that he's your captain and you don't prioritize a different first line center over the guy who's wearing the C on his chest. I just think that's a slap in the face. And that's why I concur with you. And the fact that the bridge is burned and I, I would be stunned if he's a Vancouver Canuck next year, or I'd be stunned if he's a Vancouver Canuck after the trade deadline. Actually, funny enough, I'm com- going to compare him to Nazem Kadri real quick. Kadri actually got what was actually a pretty fair free agent contract, uh, five years, 7 million per for, for a higher end second line center. That's actually, I think that that was good value. So time will tell what happens with Horvat, but. Yeah. I've just, I, I've just seen, and I was a little wary about Kadri too in the off season. I wasn't exactly sure how that contract uh, was going to end up. And again, we're still going to have to see, um, but I think five over se- five times seven point five is a realistic comparison for what Bo Horvat uh, could get on the open market. But I just see a lot of fifty sub fifty point seasons, and I just don't know about giving a player who's only produced that, despite all the other stuff that he does, being a captain, being a leader in the locker room, winning faceoffs. I just don't know if that's worth seven and a half million dollars. Um, but whoever signs him, they'll have to deal with that. Um, but again, I won't have to worry about that because it's not going to be the Rangers. <laughs> Yeah, then again, with Horvat, you also have to look at the team that he's had around him. It just, it has not been good. <laughs> yeah, it has not been good, for sure. All right. And as we always do, let's end this podcast on some Rangers talk. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I mean, we're exa- actually, you know what? First of all, let's uh, let's give a shout out to some guys coming off of injury or coming back from injury. Wilson, Tom Wilson and Nicholas Backstrom are back for the Capitals. Uh, Wilson was out with the uh, was it a leg injury i believe he tore his acl Oof! I, oh yeah that's right he's been yeah, out of- yeah, yeah so he's back for the caps that's actually that's big for them because even without both of them 
the Caps are still stuck around in a playoff spot, which is impressive because Ovi's gone off. Backstrom coming back in general is next to a miracle because the specific thing that he had injured and the surgeries that he had, no one player I think has come back to play games and every other player was basically forced into retirement because they d- weren't able to physically come back. So that's impre- like good for Backstrom. I actually like Nicholas, Nicholas Backstrom. He's one of those players that uh, even though he plays on a rival, uh, you appreciate his game. Yeah. Uh, and it was <clears throat> hip surgery uh, that Backstrom underwent. And I believe Ryan Kessler was the only the, player to return. Du- double hip surgery. Double hip surgery. And I believe that Ryan Kessler was the only player to return and play games after having that done. And Kessler only played uh, a handful of games after that. So like you said, remarkable that he's made his way back. And even though I hate him with every single fiber in my being, Welcome back, Tom Wilson. It's good to see mm. you. All right. uh, also, uh, Patty Kane was out for a couple games for Chicago. He came back. And Josh Norris making his return tonight for the Ottawa Senators. My fantasy teams, my fantasy teams have been waiting for this one. I am excited. I am very yeah. excited because Josh Norris, man, good young player, and he's going to be one of those turn uh cornerstones of ottawa moving forward they you know, just need uh, to make the right moves around them they do and <clears throat> you talk about a team that's in a full-on rebuild and you know has young players and has you know a chance to you know kind of manipulate what the roster is going to look like a lot is happening with the ottawa senators they're just stuck in quicksand for me i just don't know the reason i can't wrap my head around why they haven't made more improvements that they than they've made up to this point in the year. And I think Josh Norris coming back is going to help with that big time. They've had trouble putting the puck in the net. Josh Norris is that guy on the power play. He had 35 goals last year. And I would expect him uh, to build off of that uh, once he returns to the lineup. And also Ryan Reynolds off of the hockey side for a little bit. You know, <laughs> he's going to buy the Ottawa Senators. That's really, really super cool. Yeah. So uh, this franchise is uh, is looking up and good for your fantasy team too. Let me know how Norris uh, how Norris impacts uh, your uh, your score. Honestly, I could probably keep him in one of the leagues on IR this week and still dominate. <laughs> right. Yeah, my team's been going off so far this week. But uh, just to, real quick for Ottawa, I honestly think they're – two to three players away from being a perennial playoff team. It's got to be the right two to three players, yes. um, but I'm with you. And I think maybe a head coaching change too. I don't know if DJ Smith is the guy yeah. to get you to the playoffs. I like DJ Smith. I've gone on record saying that he's a pretty good coach, but again, I just think you need to upgrade from being in a rebuild and being a young team that wants to develop from being a playoff contending team. And I think that's the next step for Ottawa. Yeah, they're close. They're close. They're close. Yeah, they'll get there. And now, as we always do, let's end this podcast on some Rangers talk. So, how did we lose to Montreal? Because I missed that game. It was the most nothing game I've watched in quite a while from our beloved New York Rangers. Really? Uh, Chris Kreider was not in the lineup. And it makes a big difference. As much as people love to say that, you know, Chris Kreider is invisible sometimes, you know, he he does have an impact in many different ways. I think the fact that he wasn't in the lineup kind of hampered the Rangers. Montreal was just coming at them the whole game. They carried the play. Uh, the high danger chances went towards the Canadians. Shesterkin was terrific, uh, but there wasn't much he could do. He got one power play goal from Artemi Panarin. Sam Montembeau, I got to say, he was good. I picked him up in fantasy. He's he's been doing good. He was really good, and uh, you know it was just just a nothing game, just a Sunday afternoon, you know, in the middle of January, just a stinker. You know that that's just how I describe it. And Montreal came to play. Give them credit. Marty Saint Louis got his team ready to rock against the team that he used to uh, you know play for. Um, so again, just a nothing game. That's how I would describe it. Speaking of nothing games, and I'm just talking about this in terms of enjoyment purposes. The next night against Columbus, which was Monday night. Oh, my dude. I was watching that game. I was so bored. Columbus just, they stink. (laughs) Columbus is horrible. (laughs) They stink. I think that they are the worst team in the NHL. I think it's between them and Chicago. And Anaheim. Anaheim's there, too. You know, but... uh... Just goes to show you how many teams are, are racing for Connor Bedard. But, mm-hmm. um, 
Yeah, you know, Shades, it's interesting because I actually found that game against the Blue Jackets pretty exciting. And you know why? It's because I watched the game against Montreal the night before, which if you thought the game against Columbus was boring, oh my goodness, try to go back and sit through the two and a half hours of Rangers versus Canadians from Sunday night. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and not do that. <laughs> It'll put you to bed. It'll put you to bed so, so soon. I don't care how many cold brews you drink beforehand. Um, but that's another thing that stood out to me, uh, just how bad Columbus is. And I don't think the Rangers were necessarily at their best, but I think they need to be operating at 45% to beat the Blue Jackets. And that's that's how they operated. They won the hockey game, and you move along. And we got a huge, huge test tomorrow night. Can't wait. Yeah, as you said, Kreider was out, which – may a little bit may have made a little bit of a difference but there's also a uh a stomach bug or something going around in the locker room that okay. could have that could have possibly had a major effect on the games too and uh Julian Gautier is, is also out right now and they miss Julian Gautier they definitely do you know they miss that depth in that bottom six, of course, tree, uh, Reeves uh, traded away Gautier injured Sammy Blay providing absolutely nothing so you know no comment. New week, same result, right? No comment. Yeah. Uh, also, the Rangers called up Jake Lecision. That was, uh, yeah, they claimed him off waivers. And and he's, if you look at his advanced analytics stat card, he's at uh, 0%. Provides pretty much nothing. Um, but he's 23 years old. And he's a centerman. And he can win faceoffs. So, and he has NHL experience on the Vegas Golden Knights. But. He hasn't shown anything to this point that he's going to be a reliable bottom six forward. But mm. I guess for now, he's a decent placeholder. Plays with speed, I guess. Yeah. All right. Now, basically, the thing that I wanted to get to on the Rangers. Is Timo Meyer from the San Jose Sharks a possible trade deadline target? I think that Timo Meyer is the guy. I really do. Uh, he's got one more year left on his contract. And I think he is at a reasonable cap hit. Uh, if you want to double check that, um, but he's at 25 goals, 20 assists, 45 points on the sharks this year. He's the leading scorer on San Jose. He's got 309 points in 439 career games played. He's a right wing. You know, he would fit really nicely, you know, maybe alongside Philip Hedl and Artemi Panarin. I just, I, I I like it. And when I look around the NHL and when I look at the other right wingers that are available at the trade deadline, I, I think that Chris Drury would be doing the Rangers and himself a disservice if he does not go all in on Timo Meyer. Here is the only thing that I have against going after Timo Meyer. You are going to have to give up a ton because he's two-time 30-goal scorer, and he's going to blow past that mark this year. He had 76 points last year. He's just under. He's literally one point under being a point-per-game player this year on a terrible San Jose Sharks team. We do need a right winger, absolutely, and I would love to have him. But another thing, he's also a restricted free agent after this year, and the only way that making the trade work this year is we would have to have San Jose retain salary because his cap hit is six million. And I saw something his qualifying offer for next year is ten million. Well we wouldn't have to move that much money, right? To make six million work, at least for this year, right? According to Cap Friendly, deadline cap space five million, current cap space like two point six. Five million. Okay. So San Jose would have to retain, but I don't think that San Jose would necessarily mind retaining if it meant, you know, getting a better package, even if it's just for half a year, you know? Yeah. The question becomes though, you're kind of going to force yourself into a position where you're going to have to get rid of somebody if you want him re-signed. Because if you're going to acquire a restricted free agent at the trade deadline, and then trade him in the off season. I don't know, but I don't, that's an interesting discussion. I think if they would acquire him at the deadline, I think it would come with the principle that he would get extended in the off season. Might even come with an extension. Now, 
another problem with that, that's going to raise the trade value through the roof. Well, and that was going to be my next point. I'm not going to sit here and say that the Rangers aren't going to have to pay up. It's a, it's not Kravtsov, Jones, and a first-round pick is not going to be enough. I'm talking Kako. I'm talking even Lafreniere. Like, I'm serious. Like, you know, there's no room for him. You know, he's already been a part of trade discussions. You want to pique San Jose's interest? How about Alexi Lafreniere? How about the player that you have to pay as a restricted free agent come the offseason? And then there was another batshit crazy idea, one that I don't agree with at Hit all. Me. It's batshit crazy. It's crazy. Including Truba in the trade and making the money work to get Carlson back. Um, I, I know it sounds batshit crazy. I know. Ah, uh, okay. Look, um, I love saw that Eric Carlson. around Twitter. <laughs> I, I love Eric Carlson, but for that cap hit, no. Right, and I, I would hope to assume that that whoever brought that up would assume that the cap hit wouldn't be the same. Alone. Now, granted, he would be much better offensively than Truba, but this physicality aspect would be basically gone. And I mean, both aren't the greatest defensively. <laughs> would you rather pay Carlson eleven million for the remainder of his contract, or just and 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 everything else with Stan? You know, don't put everything else to the side with the Rangers cap situation. Would you rather pay Carlson full amount of money, remainder of his contract, or Truba? For me, it's Eric Carlson. I would pay the extra three million to get rid of Truba and bring Carlson on the blue line. I would. Now the money wouldn't work. There would be no way to make the money work. But I'm saying hypothetically, physicality and hurting other players and raising elbows to their heads. And the one thing about the Montreal Canadiens game that I didn't really mention to you was Truba came and uh, stick straight to the side of Joel Armia just at the end of regulation. Just like he's out for a couple weeks now. I don't know what the the injury is. You know, it's just I don't I don't know. I don't know. I mean, okay, San Jose here's, was three here is a anyway, so. here's a point in favor of that. Um, one, even strength and power play would probably be improved offensively. Fox and Carlson at the point. <sighs> yeah, and also, I mean, just imagine Eric Carlson on a team with Artemi Panarin, Mika Zibanejad, and Philip Hedl. And Carlson can still play. Is he getting overpaid grossly? Yes. Yeah. But Carlson can still play. Yeah. So going, yeah, he can. So going back to Timo Meyer, I th- he's definitely more realistic than Patty Kane based on the cap hit alone. But the fact is, like I said, restricted free agent, if you want to pay him, like I just listed off his stats earlier. He had 76 points last year, 35 goals. He had 30 goals three years ago, and he's going to blow past the 30-goal, 65-point mark this year on a terrible team. If I'm San Jose, I'm asking for at least a first and a top prospect and or roster player. If it comes down to giving Capo Caco, I would. Lafreniere, I'd have to, I'd have to seriously think about. Um, I would only trade Lafreniere in a trade for Timo Meyer if I know Timo Meyer is getting extended. Mm. If Timo Meyer's an RFA and there's a decision to make, and Lafreniere's off the roster, no thanks. Now here's the thing: we have 40 mil in cap space dedicated to forwards next year, 21.4 dedicated to defensemen, and then we have Igor at five six. So that is roughly 67 million and Meyer like he's not going to sign for anything under like seven and a half million so just uh hypothetically let's say 74 and a half you would have one two three four five six seven eight nine you'd have 10 forward signed four defensemen but Miller would also need an extension, as would Heedle. So cap space would become very tight all of a sudden. 
It would. And again, I think extending Meyer is a bridge we'll cross when they get there, if they get there. But I think it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. I don't think they'd bite on Kravtsov. I think Kako is the more realistic mm. piece to go the other way. But I think if San Jose bit on Kako, you know, I think they, they would probably go for a trade like that. You know, no principle of an extension. You know, I would give up Kako for Meyer for half a year. Call me crazy, but but Meyer could win us the Stanley Cup, you know. And at the end of the day, I don't really care about the future. We're New Yorkers; we care about instant gratification. Mm-hmm. We want to see the team win a Stanley Cup as soon as possible. And Timo Meyer, at the end of the day, does that. But Patrick Kane does that too. And you don't have to give up a Kako for a Patrick Kane. You know, maybe you could get away from trading Kravtsov, Jones, and a first round pick and get Kane at fifty percent. You know, you never know. See, this is the problem. Like, I said this to a friend a couple weeks back, and he agreed with me. Winning the lot, the draft lottery, getting the first, second, and first overall pick in 2019-20 was the worst possible thing that could have happened for the rebuild. The timing was just not right. The timing was not right, but I think it's key to have patience, especially with Alexi. Yes. I think we can see the raw skill that Kako has. He's not producing the points, but you can tell that once he figures it out, He's going to be a serviceable top six player in the least. Yeah. And honestly, I think like, I don't think Kraftsov has been bad this year. Yeah. Do I, I just don't think he's finishing, you know? Yeah. But he's getting his chances. I agree. Yeah. That's the problem. Like you're hoping like to get rid of the right young player, but at the same time, like if they go elsewhere and develop, you messed up. Yeah, that's, you know, we already saw how tough that was with Niels Lundqvist. He's having a pretty nice year in Dallas, you know, like yeah. he's, he's on their top pairing, you know, just saying. So yeah. it's such a Jekyll and Hyde thing. It really is. That's why I'm happy I'm not a GM. Same. Uh, now I'm happy to be a GM in NHL franchise mode. Oh, right off. And pull off just the absolute craziest trades. <laughs> yeah, so... All right. I, I like that discussion that we had. Yeah, no, I thought it was good. Um, for sure. And I think Tarasenko's in that conversation as well. You know, there are so many right wingers, mm. elite right wingers that the Rangers could go with. And I think there's points for each of them. Tarasenko playing alongside Artemi Panarin. It's a nice connection to have. Kane and Panarin, don't even have to discuss. Timo Meyer, I think at the end of the day, Shades, Timo Meyer is a long term move. Yeah. And I think for the Rangers this year, the player they add, I think it's more conducive for their long-term plan to get somebody for the short term. Mm. So that, that would be my argument against Meyer. And I think other teams are going to be interested in Meyer too. If oh, the yeah. Rangers are the ones walking out with them, well, the Devils are going to make them fight for it. You know, I know the Devils are going to be interested in Timo Meyer. You know, like, do you really want to bid yourself up and lose out on your young players that could have make an impact elsewhere? But mm. again, yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting. But uh, I don't know if I had to put money on it. I I would probably say the Rangers don't end up with them. If I put money on it, I'd say that Kane is a Ranger. I I just think it makes too much sense. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Well, we'll see what happens. In the meantime, yep. uh, who, do, who do the Rangers play? Bruins tomorrow night. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> That's going to be a rough game. Bruins, I think they might surprise. Bruins, Panthers, Maple Leafs, next three games, and then Vegas next Friday. And then they have like a week off. A week plus off. Panthers, Maple Leafs, and Vegas don't really scare me, to no. be honest. No, yeah. no, Panthers are underachieving. Vegas, I mean, that could be a tough game because they've actually they got a good team. Yeah, they've been, they're injured though. Mark Stone's back on the injured reserve with his back. Oh boy, his long term. Uh, I don't know. He went. Uh, he was on the IR for a while last year with a back injury. It's just one of those things that persists. I, yeah, back Robin injuries Leonard. suck. Yeah. And also wishing the best for Robin Leonard, who has gone bankrupt. Oh, yeah, God. that was – when I heard that, that was insane. Yeah, no, that was scary for sure. Living in Vegas, that's what we'll do. Yeah, so – yeah, I guess we'll uh, we'll come back on the uh, 
on the 31st because I I don't want to record and then have one game over like an eight day span. So we'll uh, mm-hmm. we'll wait the extra couple days and record again probably on the 30th to put an episode out on the 31st. So yeah. Yeah, that's about all I got. You got anything? That's all I got. All right. Well, this has been episode 31 of Pucks and Brews. I have been your host, Michael Sparacino, alongside Liam Gautamer. And yeah, we'll be back on the 30th. I hope everybody enjoyed a drink of choice, chilled out, and listened to some hockey during the uh, during the episode. Uh, enjoy football the next two weekends, because shit's going to get crazy. And we will be back at the end of the month. Oh, wait, I'm an idiot. I am such an idiot. You Glad did, you said it. You Did you catch my mistake? I didn't, no. I just said we'll be back on the 30th. There's only 28 days in February. <laughs> well, we're in January. Are we? Oh, yeah, my God. <laughs> oh, my a, God. You're a double idiot. <laughs> Don't, triple idiot. Jesus, mother of God. All right. <laughs> we will be back on January. Did I say February 30th, too? My uh, no, I think you, you just said the 30th. If you just kept it the way it was, you would have been just fine. Yeah, probably. My God. Jesus Christ. And this is with a large cold brew. Jesus. So we'll be back on January 31st is when the episode is going to come out. Everybody, have a drink. Yeah, let's drink to remember, not drink to forget. All right. This has been Pucks and Brews. Have a good one, everybody. <laughs>